Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our keynote opening presentation for the 2021 Investable Showcase, um, titled Biotech in 2021, Another Wave, or as the title slide here suggests, Continued Growth. I'm delighted to be joined by our knowledge partners, McKinsey and Alexander Zemp and uh, Joseph Leiden, who are going to be guiding us through uh, the report and presentation this morning. A uh, quick reminder, as I mentioned in uh, my opening remarks, for those who, who listened to those just now, um, the live discussion uh, box on the right hand side is where you can ask your questions throughout the, the whole event to all of our speakers. And um, for this morning, as we work through the presentation, if you do have any questions based on any of the uh, stats, analysis, and research that have gone into this report, uh, or more generally, um, please do put them in that chat and questions box um, on the right hand side of your screen. But for now, uh, delighted to hand over to Alexandra, who's going to uh, kick us off uh, for the Investable Showcase in 21, 2021. So, Alexandra, over to you. Thank you, Josh. And um, thank you, LSX, for um, hosting us again next uh, this year. And very much looking forward to the presentation and to seeing everyone's um, reactions to it. Um, for those of you who joined this keynote last year, you may remember what we looked at. We looked at 2020 at an unprecedented wave of biotech um, funding in difficult times for all of us um, during the global pandemic. Um, today, we'll take it from there and actually look at how has 2021 been? And did we actually see in 2021 so far another wave or did we rather see a low tide? Now, what we will present today is based on a series of interviews with investors and biotech executives we conducted in preparation for the meeting. So thanks already here for the time you spent with us in those discussions, but also various deep data analysis we conducted and lastly also on our work with many biotechs as their strategic partner. Let me start with the takeaways um, as we look at to, um, today's presentation. Um, the first one being that um, as a heads up, like look, if you look at the first three quarters of 2021, we actually see an unprecedented level of funding and deal making to continue. While of course the jury is still out on what is going to happen in Q4 um, this year. On the other hand, we probably see a bit of a lower tide to stay with the analogy um, on the stock market where we have seen a bit more muted returns since early 2021, where the midterm performance of the sector stays very strong. After looking kind of at this kind of 2020 view, we're gonna take a bit of a deeper look at this unprecedented funding level that we have seen now, how has it actually impacted the sector overall? Um, and we're going to see some interesting impact there on the flexibility that um, biotechs have now, but also on where the financing is moving um, um, coming up. And then lastly, we end today almost with a similar question as we did last year, closing with the question on will the biotech wave continue for Q4 2021? And what do we expect to see in 2022? But let me actually start with the first part here, the financing and deal activity. And I actually start with looking back at 2020. And if you recall what we have seen in 2020, we have seen an unprecedented level of um, funding activity. And just to give you a few highlights that you can see here is we have seen a 55% year on year increase in VC funding, going up to total VC funding of uh, almost 40 billion um, for the biotech sector in 2020. We have seen an almost 150% increase in new IPO raises last year. And we also saw um, a significant increase in the number and value of deals in terms of acquisition, partnerships, um, and licensing happening. We're now going to go through these elements quickly one by one to give you a bit of a flavor on how 2021 has been so far. Um, and starting um, actually now first um, at the 2021 picture for those in a summary. And what you're going to see in summary on 2021 here is um, 
Of course, the jury is still out for the full year, but what we see in Q1 to Q3 looks actually um, similarly promising as last year. The VC funding appears to be still growing vis-a-vis -vis 2020, a single digit, um, but still. We see actually that the new IPO raises have almost reached the full year um, 2020 figures already now in Q3. Um, and we also see that the deal values appear so far higher than in the same period in 2020. Um, given on the deal side, the importance of Q4, I guess here the jury is still most out on what's going to come um, this and next month to confirm on um, whether the deal um, activity is the same this year as it has been last year. But overall, um, a positive message of the wave rather continuing than just seeing a low tide um, in the market. But let's start actually with looking at the VC funding more specifically. And if we look at the VC funding um, specifically, we actually um, remember from the previous day, we see the total amount is tracking to exceed 2020. However, we see actually, um, particularly in this year, two very important trends. Like on the one hand, we see that the average VC funding raised per round has significantly increased. You see that it's almost a 40% increase on the average funding raised in a single VC round. Um, on the other hand, we also see that the number of VC funding rounds, this is kind of shown with this red arrow at the bottom, has actually gone down. This at least suggests from the data we are seeing right now that um, there is a bit of a concentration into fewer but better founded um, rounds. And this trend is actually true across all um, major um, geographies, um, probably most expressed um, in China, least expressed in the US, but you see actually the direction is pretty much the same across. But let's take it forward and look at um, IPOs, Joseph. Yes, so if we look at the number of IPOs, we're continuing to see here, and you can see it clearly, continued um, surprising growth, um, which has surpassed in previous years. So on the, the very top line, quite encouraging. And what Alex mentioned earlier is a bit, we have also seen somewhat um, somewhat muted growth. And so let's talk about where that, that we've seen. So overall, we've seen clearly a significantly larger number of biotechs actually um, going out and IPOing and looking at IPO as a source of funding um, that has continued through till Q1 of 2021. In the last two quarters, in quarter two and quarter three, we've started to see this number stop, start to come back slightly from that. That being said, if you look at the total across Q1 to Q3, it's still significantly higher than where we were at in, in 2020 in terms of total capital raised. In terms of the average amounts, what we're seeing is um, that they're fluctuating uh, around a pretty stable level with being only 4% lower than 2020. And so the one, one comment of comment and what we've heard from investors on this is that the, um, the generalists that came in and invested quite significantly through 2020 um, have become a bit more cautious and stepped back a bit um, in, the last, in the last two, three quarters. And so that could be driving some of the, the um, numbers that we're seeing here on the screen. If we look now here as well at follow-on raises, so biotechs that are considering actually following on through public markets to raise further, we're also seeing, again, um, continued levels of growth, though a slight pullback from where 2020 was. And what we heard uh, consistently in this is the amount of activity that in 20, what we saw in 2020 was unprecedented, um, oftentimes unexpected. Um, and so even though we're seeing a slight uh, decrease vis-a-vis -vis 2020, still these numbers are at tremendous highs compared to where they were at before. Um, and what you're seeing here in the top row is the number of follow-ons, um, how, many, how many numbers that has actually changed. And then in the middle section, actually, what is the total amount that's been raised through follow-ons, which has been um, lower than the high that we saw in 2020. Now, we spoke, so that's a little bit where the IPO section, now the third, kind of column that uh, Alex had mentioned earlier was 
where actually are we seeing deals and what are these deals looking like? And what we've looked at here is trying to break down the deals in terms of the different types of deals that we're actually talking about, because there can manifest themselves from whether it's M&A, licensing, different types of collaboration, clinical collaboration types of deals. And if we zoom in first on M&A, um, the number of deals that we've seen in M&A is yet continuing to grow um, in 2021 as well. We're seeing quite a significant number. What you see in the blue, the dark blue and the teal blue is the number of, of um, large or mega deals. And in 2021, we've had you know, some large and mega deals. However, at least there has not yet been uh, one of the, or there have been as, some, as many mega deals as we've seen in, in recent years. Um, so as per Alex's original comment, the jury is still out a little bit on where Q4 will land on that. Um, so that's one of the, the, the big takeaways here. And also, if you, if you look at the value of mega deals in, in, in previous years, the amount of contribution which you're seeing in this blue highlighted row has been over the last few years uh, significantly higher than the contribution um, that you're seeing now. So really the deal activity that we're seeing in relative stability of, of the overall numbers discussed before has been due to smaller, larger number of deals that have been occurring. If we now take a moment to look at the, the other side of this circle and what actually has been going on with uh, licensing and, and collaboration agreements, what you're seeing here is again, continued growth from the 2020 levels. So on the left-hand side, we're seeing the number of deals and the number of deals, at least Q1 to Q3, is, is on track to be ahead of where we were in 2020. Um, and the total disclosed potential deal value is also um, beyond what we're seeing in 2020. So I think this continues the message of overall quite a lot of activity in the market for ex exciting innovative projects. There's opportunities to go get funding and IPOs as just discussed, but then also on the deal side, there's clearly a lot of activity going on there. The one other piece we actually looked at is now saying, okay, and we'd heard that, you know, which area you're in, which therapeutic area um, is driving a lot of the number of partnerships or the partnership discussions um, and whether or not deals are made. And what you're seeing here is the number of deals, number of partnerships basically broken down by therapeutic area. And, um, Somewhat you now in retrospect, uh, fully expected or to be understood is the number of deals around infectious diseases clearly um, grew significantly in 2020 um, through, throughout the pandemic. That has started to, to pull back slightly, though it's still a significant share. Um, what I think is also interesting is that across other therapeutic areas, as well as oncology, we're seeing as well as just overall a larger uptick in the number of partnerships. So if we now you know, shift to the second point that uh, we talked about with where is the market performance been? Um, <clears throat> I think one thing to just, just kind of start on, which is a, a kind of super positive message that um, if you look over the long term and historically, the biotech's, uh, biotech market performance has been has outperformed both the NASDAQ composite as well as the S&P 500. So I think the, the, the takeaway message here is this is an exciting place to be. And one of the reasons why we're excited, of course, um, around uh, the biotech industry overall. If we, what we wanted to do is look at how have now the last um, year and a half to two years, so starting from 2020, the beginning of 2020, what has this been playing out for everyone? And, and what has been the market feel since then? And I think if we look at first this first period, so through till the beginning of August, uh, through the end of July, um, what you're seeing here is, is, you know, the biotech pulled from the low of the pandemic out faster, faster than at the, at least the NASDAQ and S&P, and was one of the fastest markets to respond with, with tremendous market performance and quite some size. And that was something we had discussed quite a lot, a lot through last year. So um, those are some of the tremendous gains we had seen through the kind of, August to November period through last year, um, there was muted growth, 
with the rest of the market still growing as it's kind of coming out of the pandemic, but um, muted growth, at least from the biotech industry. Now, in, in November last year, then there was the announcement of the first COVID vaccine. And following that, we then saw, again, a, a tremendous spur of biotech innovation with 20%, 26% um, growth of the biotech indice versus the NASDAQ composite at 19 and the S&P 500 at, at 10%. And, and now, you know, since that, that high that we saw in February, we've now had a more muted performance from the, the bio and dis, biotech um, market performance overall, where what you're seeing here is um, compared to the NASDAQ composite and the S&P, um, the, bio, the biotech industry returns have been uh, negative 3%. And so I think this, this just highlights that at least through the last um, seven, eight months, there's been more muted gains than what we had seen through, through the, the beginning of the pandemic. So what we've heard from investors and what could be some of the drivers that are sitting behind this. So first there's been, and this has been kind of through and through, there's been a long-term positive view that investors have highlighted that there are really tremendous fundamentals of the industry and, um, and a belief that, okay, there, there's, there's not a worry that this should be um, significantly a challenge. Um, there's a tremendous amount of capital out there on both the public and private side, and that the, the sector continues to be strong. Um, that the, the innovation is still there and the paradigm shifts are actually still occurring. So tremendous excitement that this is actually strong fundamentals in the industry. At the same time, throughout um, 2021, 2021, we're starting to see some of that rapid gain actually normalize over the last two quarters, where people have become more selective in where they want to invest. We talked a little bit about earlier about how many of the generalists that may have come in uh, looking at biotech through the pandemic as a bit of a safe haven have become a bit more cautious and stepped back a bit. Um, and then finally, that uh, public, public markets and particularly some of the smaller and mid caps have actually sold off. Um, and and um, there are of course um, areas of outperformance. However, this has happened uh, quite a bit across the board. If we just, we, we wanted to put some numbers against that. And so what we looked at were um, the three month post IPOs. So we talked about the tremendous level of IPOs that occurred through 2020 and 2021. And what we looked at is what's the three months post IPO performance um, of, of, of IPOs that were either IPO'd in 21 or 2020. And what you're seeing is that in 2020, about 60% of those that actually IPO'd outperformed three months later, as opposed to 2021, um, only 19% did. So <clears throat> this shows a bit the, you know, one, the post-performance, but also the um, immediate excitement and, and returns that, that IPO'd companies showed in the market. I think the one thing to reflect on is, we just talked a little bit around Hey, there's been some muted gains. At the same time, even if we look at just over this, um, you know, limited snapshot picture from the beginning of 2020 to now, where we are end of 2021, the, the industry is still an extremely exciting place to be with 40% return over that period of time. Um, and so uh, just the, the growth is still there, the fundamentals are still there, and the innovation is still there. So we continuously heard this is still an extremely exciting place uh, to be, both from an investor side and from the biotech side. With that, um, Alex, I'll pass it back to you on the impact of financing mm -hmm. this. Yeah, and we were wanted to go a bit deeper, right? Like beyond stating the facts on a bit understanding with this unprecedented wave of funding coming into the sector, how is this actually changing the industry? How is it changing the strategy biotechs pursue? How is it changing investors? How investors behave? And is it actually changing or is biotech industry the same today as it was 10 years ago. And we're going to look now at um, three um, major shifts um, that we identified on how the industry structure is actually is actually changing. First, um, we're going to see um, that the higher level of um, funding um, larger rounds have actually increased the flexibility of biotechs and allow them to build um, stronger pipelines and shape 
their um, exit path themselves. Second, we're also going to see that the growing interest um, in the sector is shifting investment and deal making um, to earlier stages. And thirdly, we also see now more biotechs, more investors, which is on the one side exciting, but on the flip side, we also hear from many of, uh, speaking to many of our, our biotech investors, biotech executives, that this has led also to some variance in the quality on both the investor um, and the biotech side. But let's start to look at this first point I mentioned with the higher um, flexibility um, for biotechs. And I'm just trying to see the slides are not moving on the screen, I think. So let, me, me one, let me just give me one second. It's turning up. In a second again. One second. Oh. Voila, the technical um, the technical glitch you always uh, wish for wish for to happen. Um, so where we are seeing um, so on this more flexibility point, um, we actually did um, an analysis of looking at the top thirty most um, funded biotechs. And the way we define the top 30 um, most funded biotechs is actually looking at the biotechs that have received um, in the period of 2000 and 2002 versus 2015 to 2017, um, the most funding in terms of VC funding, IPOs um, and follow-ons. And for simplicity, we just call them here past stars and current stars um, so that we have kind of a good uh, nomenclature of closure, nomenclature here. And already starting with this very simple view, right? If you look at the sum of what the most funded by top 30 most funded biotechs got in terms of finding funding in three year periods, 2000 to 2002, versus 2015 to 2017, you actually see already um, a, a more than 200% increase on how much funding those companies um, acquired. Now, if you actually look at that more uh, deeper and more excitingly, I find, we actually see that this funding has allowed the biotech companies to actually rise more than um, to actually start more than three times the number of clinical trials um, than what we have seen um, earlier. Similarly, we've also seen that um, over a period of six years, these companies have actually been able to develop three times more distinct assets um, than what we have seen in the past. And of course, um, while licensing has kind of been common both in the past and today, and you see a similar number of deals um, in the past with, um, with 45 versus 55 for this current star view, we actually see that the deal values have gone up significantly with an 11 times higher average deal size for in licensing, looking at known deal values. Now, this is pretty much consistent with what many of you um, told us in our interviews and discussions, that the larger rounds actually allow you to have more ambitious plans, that they allow you to de-risk pipelines, and that you can accelerate um, pipeline development. Now, you could suspect that the larger rounds that are raised are actually also leading to the fact that there is um, less time between and uh, more time between rounds and that people uh, biotechs last longer till they go for the next funding round. And we actually see that this is not true, but rather the opposite. So if you're looking at the time between different funding rounds, we actually see um, that the time um, has rather decreased um, yearly at a rate of 3% 
between the different funding rounds, actually suggesting and confirming what I just be, said before, that the additional funding received is used to accelerate the pipeline, to strengthen the pipeline, rather than just taking more time um, in, in the biotech. Another impact that we also have seen um, with this increased amount of funding available is that it has increased significantly the flexibility for biotechs to pursue their own strategy. And one element of that is that we see more and more biotechs considering or going for launching an asset themselves, um, where you can see the numbers here on the screen. And we also hear that pretty much reflected in the sentiment in what many biotech executives are telling, telling us, uh, which is um, we hear from many of you that actually the focus today is much more towards building a company or succeeding in bringing an asset through clinical development rather than just thinking about what's the fast and best exit path, which is from, from the discussions I have heard, quite a mindset change if you compare that to five, five, 10 years ago. So in a nutshell, on the first point I mentioned, right, we see actually strategies changing quite significantly right now with this increasing funding in fl flowing into the sector. I think, Secondly, um, and that's no surprise um, probably to any of you, is that we are seeing funding activity move to earlier stages. And we see um, that for the period of 2019 to 2021, that actually 45% of VC funding has been in preclinical stages. And this has led to some changes in the operating model of how some investors are actually looking at biotechs. And we heard from some of our discussions in interviews that um, you're much more, some investors are starting to look much more systematically already at academic papers to understand where there is potential um, coming out of university directly, collaborating with universities, but also almost then taking assets out of the universities and building own companies to get access to the best science rather than waiting for assets to kind of move through the pipeline. And we also see this kind of earlier trend, um, not surprisingly um, on the IPO side. We see IPOs moving significantly earlier over the past three years. Um, if you look at 20. 19 to 2021 again, we see that around 50% of IPOs are actually happening in phase one or earlier. And that by now, um, on the right hand side of this chart, 85% um, of companies actually IPO by now latest after Series C versus 64% of companies 10 years ago, right? So you actually see that um, series D and Series E fin financing by now have become almost negligible um, compared um, to where IPOs are. And um, not surprisingly then taking it on the partnership side, you of course also see that reflected on the partnership side where we see that 76% um, of partnering deals by now are happening phase one or earlier. And actually, most of that um, within the preclinical phases. So, I guess all of us, or many of us, had the hypothesis that partner uh, financing and everything is moving earlier. I think this is just the confirming the hypothesis of what many of us had when looking at um, the market. And I think similarly, I think another hypothesis, of course, um, we all look at that there are just more IPOs and that more IPOs are becoming a more popular funding option um, for biotechs. And we see that um, it has that by IPOs have become, um, or public money has become relevant in the sense of 27% of all funding rounds um, are actually by now 
funding rounds that are either IPOs or follow-ons on the public markets. And even more significantly, we see that by now, 44% of the amount raised um, by biotechs is either through IPOs or follow-ons um, on the public market. And this is very consistent with what we hear, of course, from US investors and biotech executives. Um, I think what I'm most excited about the trend is um, that we hear a lot from you that biotech, uh, that IPOs are really seen as a source of funding and a path to reach business ambitions faster, to bring products to patients faster and to accelerate development rather than seeing it as an exit path um, overall. Now, we're talking about this and it probably all sounds super exciting. And just to adding a couple of more exciting facts is, I think we are at an unprecedented time for biotech overall. I think to give a few numbers, we have like 10,000 active biotechs at present. There's almost like, as I mentioned earlier, there has been almost 40 billion of VC funding um, going into biotech in 2020. And there have been around about 300 biotech IPOs in 2020 and 2021 so far combined. So you see actually the biotech activity and the inflow of capital is unprecedented. This has of course also led to new sources of money. So we see by now that there are uh, in VC rounds for biotechs around about 1,100 distinct investors, which is almost 60% more than what it was five years ago. And of course, we also see new sources um, of funding such as BACs um, emerging um, as an alternate way to raise money for biotechs. Now, we've heard from interviews with biotechs and investors that this is also a flip side to it and that this has led to higher variance in both quality um, of both biotechs and investors. And particularly on the investor side, uh, we heard um, two challenges that were raised uh, in many of the discussions we had. First of all, um, linked to the fact that also more generalist investors entered the biotech space as a safe haven, they were less experienced with the sector. And as Joseph mentioned earlier, some of them pulled back because they st almost struggle to accept sometimes the fundamentals of the or the ex experimental nature and the long cycles you have in the biotech sector. I think the other part we heard is that there are some investors actually approaching biotechs with very high investment offers, but a limited knowledge of the underlying technology um, or science. And I think this is a watch out for all of us in the presentation right now, right? For me, um, it means for biotech executives or my reflection on it is that um, the easiest route to capital may not always be the best. I think particularly if you're looking at building a sustainable company, I think there's still the path of thinking about where do I find the smart money and what are the well-known investors um, that I want to have in my company to set you up for future success rather than just for the next funding round. And I guess it's also for the investors, um, my reflection on that the underlying science is probably as essential as it has ever been. Um, paired with the fact that also US investors need to have the biotechs in your portfolio to kind of build the right investor base um, along them to have kind of a sustainable, sustainable investment setting um, in there. But overall, I think um, the sector fundamentals are super exciting. And that brings us to the last um, quick question on what does it actually mean if we look ahead into um, the rest of 2021 and at um, 2022 ahead? And first of all, um, not surprisingly, I think my first, my first take is that the fundamentals of the sector and the underlying science um, remain very strong, right? Many of us have expected end of last year that 2021 may be a tougher year for funding and deal making for biotechs. 
And so far, um, I think 2021 has proven to be a similarly unprecedented year as 2020 has been, where the jury, of course, is still out on what is happening in Q4 this year. Um, I think there is a bit of a call for action for both um, biotechs and investors. I think we have the strong science. We have a high um, investment level in the sector. And building on what I just said, um, when looking at this kind of broader landscape of investors, I think it's now up for biotech executives and investors to almost deliver on the promise um, of the science and develop successful clinical assets. And I think alongside that is talent. And I think talent will be key and fundamental to the continued growth and success of the sector. Um, and this may also require, if you just look at the sheer number of companies that are emerging, going beyond traditional routes of finding talent or doing um, actually targeted investment to build the right talent so that this sector can continue to grow, grow at the current pace um, that we have seen. So with that, I just wanted to say another big thank you to the biotech executives and the biotech investors who um, joined in our pre preparation discussions and did the interviews with us. And a big thank you also to Josh and the LSX team for hosting us. And you should find the um, presentation for Donut on our virtual booth. And now we're going into a couple of Q&A. Fantastic, thank you, Alexandra, and um, yeah, thank you for, for for all the work and putting together um, a well very comprehensive report. What I think has uh, a lot of uh, great insights um, to take from it, and, uh, and a great analysis of where we are currently. Um, now is the time for, for your questions. We do have a couple um, already that have come through, which, which I'll get to. But um, just to the right of uh, the video here, there's a live chat and questions box. So please do have your questions coming in. I certainly have some myself and we have about uh, just under 10 minutes or so for, for these questions. So um, there's a couple of questions that have come in, um, which I think you sort of alluded to slightly in, in some of those slides there. Um, which maybe is an opportunity to uh, take a slightly deeper dive into. Um, Merat Bagher has asked, um, Curious if you break uh, some of this analysis down by therapy areas and perhaps technology uh, like cell gene therapy um, as an example. So um, do you see any sort of trends in terms of uh, funding or deals by therapeutic area or, or technology? Um, so um, in, in, in full transparency, we probably haven't looked at it in full depth for all technologies and um, therapeutic areas. I think where you have seen a clear difference is, of course, for um, infectious diseases, where there was quite a hype, as also Joseph mentioned earlier, on the deal-making side, but also on the funding side, particularly in 2020, but we've also seen that uh, in the 2021 space. Um, I think um, for the rest, um, I, um, I, I look forward to share then more in the World Congress in, in February, where we can go a bit deeper on the different platforms and therapy areas. Fantastic. Yeah, um, that sounds good. So yeah, for those who don't know, McKinsey will be joining us again for our, our LSX World Congress in February, back to an in-person event and, and uh, taking a further deep dive into, into some of this analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, great opportunity to, to join us there. Um, uh, and Carolyn Porter has asked, um, are you seeing similar financing trends in Europe and the US? Um, do you see there sort of a big discrepancy still? Uh, I guess maybe the public markets are a little more obvious uh, there, but yeah, do you see similar financing trends, uh, I guess both private and public in, in Europe and the US? I would say in general, it's it's similar, right? And I think the, the important part is if you look at um, the public market, I think it's probably um, depending on how you compare apples to apples, right? But if you, for instance, compare um, European biotech companies that go to the public market on NASDAQ, you actually see that um, on NASDAQ, the average performance of a European biotech is pretty much the same as a US biotech going on the NASDAQ, right? So I think overall, if you take that together, um, you see very similar trends. Um, we have actually seen significant growth in the European biotech sector in, in the last year. 
However, the US biotech sector is still significantly larger, right? Also in terms of how much share of the overall VC funding goes into it and so on. So the trends are the same, um, but there is, there is a difference in scale um, between the US and Europe. Fantastic. Um, uh, another question just uh, come in from uh, Fabienne Roussel. Um, and I think you sort of alluded to this and, and maybe these returns are, are sort of changing certainly 2020 to 2021, but uh, she asked that there's a dip in return three months post IPO. Um, what is the longer term trend? Um, so sort of, I guess, further on than that three month um, sort of dip that, that some companies have seen, is there a longer term trend, uh, I guess, in, in the IPOs that are happening um, after that yeah. period? So maybe the, when, when looking, I mean, I think that the, IPOs that are just IPO already in 2021, the jury's a little bit still out, right? I think that the best indicator for kind of answering that question is overall, how has that performance across the biotech index actually looked like um, from a little bit of a longer term view? And that was where we showed that one, one chart that, that highlights from, you know, beginning of 2020 till now, where, what does that performance look like? And it's been overall quite positive. Um, and we as well broke this down um, by, different sizes of companies and as well on the longer term trend, there's clearly then still a positive trend uh, across um, with more variance as you get to smaller companies. Perfect. Um, and I wanted to, to ask questions sort of coming back to that sort of final point that you made in terms of uh, the sort of takeaways. Um, the, the talent topic is, is one that's been recurring. It, it's one that's been sort of, I guess, discussed um, and sort of talked about for, for quite a period of time. Do you feel any progress has been made over the last few years in terms of the uh, sort of talent um, issue? Uh, and, uh, and what do you think, what else is needed uh, in, in terms of talent? No. And I think the talent issue has probably been um, expressed at different levels across the different geographies, right? It has also always been... Um, a bigger challenge, I would say, in Europe versus the US and also in China, um, just driven also partially by the fact, right, on what is the ecosystem around you that you have and the overall entrepreneurial culture that you have in the respective geographies. I think um, if I take Europe, for, for example, um, we have seen good progress made, right? I think there are, and what I what I hear from many investors, um, the positive angle is there have been now, also in Europe, good biotech success stories. There are also examples in Europe of now companies um, that have been sold and biotech executives going into the second or even the third biotech company leading that. So you start to see that there is also in Europe, a community of biotech experience professionals emerging. I think the other positive trend you see is that this entire globalization um, of talent that actually the COVID pandemic accelerated has actually helped a lot. And you see actually um, right now, a lot of people in European biotechs that kind of emigrated to the US at some point in time actually working for European biotechs and not even necessarily relocating to Europe, but staying in the US. And I think now everybody's ability to use Zoom teams and similar platforms has helped a lot for kind of building truly global teams um, and improving the talent situation, um, the situation overall. I still believe that if you look at the sheer level of funding that goes into the sector and the sheer amount of biotechs that is there, that there is a constant need to continue to build the talent. Because if you just look at the growth numbers on number of biotechs and funding, it, you need to have the talent to grow with it. And I think that is probably still something that needs continuous attention and it will probably never go away um, as long as the sector does so well. Certainly, that makes sense. Um, very much, uh, yeah, uh, very quickly come to, to, towards the end of our time here. Do have a, a couple of um, quick questions. One, uh, and then a sort of final final question, I think. But um, how do you see the role of investors evolving, sort of the structure and increased flexibility for biotechs you outlined? How do you see the role of investors um, with these changes in the industry that you sort of uh, broke down? I think for me, um, personally, I think the investors, um, depending on whether they are leading or not, right, but for me, the scanning for the right science and understanding the value of the asset is 
becoming more and more important. And it's very different for me from what you see in terms of investors in other sectors, right? Because you need to go much deeper to understand the fundamentals. And it's not just down to the talent, but it's literally down to the science and the excitement around it, what the potential of the company is. And I think that is probably a core skill that needs to be continued to build. And even on the very early stage, right? Because as we saw, many, many of these um, funding rounds are moving into preclinical activities. So um, it actually um, requires deep scientific knowledge now for the investors to actually make a difference and find the most attractive opportunities. Certainly, and hopefully that uh, addresses the question from, from Daniel, which was sort of a, around that point as well, Daniel Smallwood. Um, so yeah, as we, we are sort of come to, come to the end here, and I guess if you do have any further questions, please do keep them in, in the chat function. Um, it will be open. Um, you know, some people will, will be listening sort of uh, on demand afterwards. Um, I'm sure um, the McKinsey team would be happy to, to continue and, and um, answer any uh, additional follow-up questions from this. So please do keep the questions coming in on the chat and indeed through their, their booth um, in the platform. But I guess my, my final question, if you had one piece of advice um, that you'd like to give to sort of biotech executives and investors after looking at all the trends you presented today, um, what would that one piece of advice be for, for the investors and, and for the biotech uh, executives? Joseph, you want to take it? Um, sure. For uh, the investors, I think it would be continue to be quite rigorous when looking at uh, the biotech opportunities that are coming in front of you, that the increased uh, availability of capital to just be uncompromising on um, not letting that, that quality at all waver. Um, and I think that there's this, this kind of dual, dual viewer when there's more capital available, there's, tons, there's many projects out there um, that, that increasingly that, you know, view on quality is, is tremendously important. And then I think the, the second piece is, and with with biotechs, Alex mentioned a little bit earlier this perspective of um, the easiest way to to capital may not always be the best. We've heard many times that the what the biotech might be going out and looking for the capital that then they're able to raise or the, or similar uh, maybe larger than that. So um, having you know just cl clear plans and clear view on okay with this capital here's actually what we're going to be going and doing with it. Um, the time that's shrinking between investment rounds despite capital, um, the, the, the total per round actually growing just highlights the importance of, um, of, of, of deploying that uh, in a really planned and well thought through way. So. Fantastic. Um, well, yeah, that's, uh, I think, a fantastic way to, to, to round us off uh, for this morning's keynote uh, presentation. Um, a huge thank you to, to Alexandra and to, to Joseph and uh, for the wider McKinsey team who, who worked on that report. As I said, please do um, keep the, the conversation going, uh, visit their booth and uh, keep uh, going in the chat functions and we can get to those um, over the course of the next week with the platform open. Um, we're back in uh, just over 10 minutes now for our sort of opening panel. We'll be hearing from some of the investors that uh, contributed to this report as well. Uh, on the panel titled Early Stage Innovation uh, and Investment Saturation and Opportunity. So um, please do join us at, at 10 o'clock GMT uh, for our next session. Um, but for now, thanks again to McKinsey and um, see you all shortly. <laughs>